religious freedom, federal protection for pro-life Americans from the government. View from the White House. President Trump is set to make history during this year's march. How the White House is energizing the pro-life movement. Love is in the air, another first for Pope Francis. This time, 36,000 feet up. And it's as easy as a tap. The Archdiocese of Paris puts a modern twist on the collection plate. Coming up on EWTN News Nightly for Thursday, January 18th, 2018. Good evening from Washington, D.C., and thank you to those of you joining us from around the world for news from a Catholic perspective. I'm Lauren Ashburn. The Trump administration launches a new government office to protect the religious rights of medical professionals. Capitol Hill correspondent Jason Calvi was there at Health and Human Services headquarters for the big announcement. Good evening, Jason. Good evening, Lauren. The new Conscience and Religious Freedom Division will investigate complaints by doctors and nurses pressured to violate their beliefs. Now, that includes healthcare workers objecting to abortion or transgender surgery. Today, I spoke one on one with the HHS official rolling out this new division. Things are changing for the better. Uh, the federal government has not always been as protective of religious freedom as it is required to be, and that is changing today, here, and now. Good morning, my name is Roger. Roger Severino is the director of the Office for Civil Rights at the Department of Health and Human Services. The veteran attorney will oversee the Division for Conscience and Religious Freedom. Americans United for the Separation of Church and State slams the administration. The group says the move will sanction using religion to deny patients access to health care. But Severino disagrees, telling me the government will be enforcing current U.S. laws, like the Weldon Amendment which protects healthcare workers who object to doing abortions. There has been pent up demand and that demand is out there. People's conscience rights uh, have been violated. People are bringing the complaints forward. In fact, Severino says his office for civil rights has seen a spike in conscience complaints. From 2008 through November 2016, HHS received 10. Since President Trump's election, it's fielded 34 complaints. The new division will help workers like Catholic nurse Kathy DiCarlo. I still have nightmares about that day. That day when she was forced to help with an abortion. My faith in God and the Catholic Church's teachings about the sanctity of all human life further inspired my career in nursing. Democrats say this office could undermine the rights of women, gays, and transgender people. Senator Patty Murray of Washington State says this lets ideology dictate who can get care. But House Majority Leader Kevin McCarthy says the division is needed to prevent the rise of religious persecution. Lauren? We see things like this in new administrations come and go. How easy will it be for the next, maybe Democratic, administration to shut down this division? Roger Severino tells me it would be very hard. Today's actions make the Conscience and Religious Freedom Division a part of the Department of Health and Human Services. He describes religious freedom as a fundamental civil right that future administrations should want to protect. Capitol Hill correspondent Jason Calvi, thank you for that report. On Capitol Hill also, senators defend the rights of pro-life Americans to reject policies that violate their deeply held beliefs. The right of conscience should be protected for every person. Religious intolerance is a personal choice not a legal requirement in America. Senators spoke for nearly an hour about pro-life legislation. Their speeches come one day before the March for Life. The White House reveals new information about tomorrow's presidential address to the March for Life. They say he will be surrounded by pro-life students and youth when he speaks from the Rose Garden. White House correspondent Mark Irons reports. Good evening, Mark. Good evening, Lauren. It's never been done before. Via a live satellite feed, the president will speak directly to the expected 100,000 or more people who will march tomorrow. And some of the pro-lifers who will listen to his message are here by the White House tonight. God bless you and God bless America. Thank president Trump will make history when he appears in the Rose Garden tomorrow, giving a live video message to a packed rally gathered just a few hundred yards away at the March for Life. 
The president is committed to protecting the life of the unborn, and he is excited to be part of this historic event. Trump's live TV broadcast from the White House will be a presidential first. George W. Bush addressed the rally through a phone call, and before him, President Ronald Reagan. We're told about a woman's right to control her own body, but doesn't the unborn child have a higher right, and that is to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness? Last year, Vice President Mike Pence pumped up the crowd. Life is winning again in America. Tonight, he's meeting with pro-life youth from Students for Life at his office next to the White House. We want the vice president to hear from us. And from Kristen Hawkins, the president of Students for Life, says it shows a lot about the White House's commitment to the pro-life movement. We were invited. We were invited to come and share you know, the on the ground, what is happening in the pro-life movement, how the abortion industry is affecting us, our generation. March for Life organizers estimate 80 to 90 percent of tomorrow's pro-life crowd in the nation's capital will consist of young people. To give you an idea of the excitement building here, earlier today a White House official told me the March for Life is like the Super Bowl of the pro-life movement. Lauren. Vice President Mike Pence and White House Counselor Kellyanne Conway both spoke last year. Are they speaking this year? No, Vice President Pence is leaving on his trip to the Middle East to address, among other things, religious persecution. And Kellyanne Conway tells News Nightly she's not speaking at the march this year because she, quote, traded up to President Trump. <laughs> that she did. White House correspondent Mark Guyers. Organizers are busy preparing for tomorrow's pro-life rally. Our News Nightly cameras caught crews busy on the National Mall putting the final touches on the stage area. Thousands of pro-lifers from across the nation are expected in Washington tomorrow. Stay with EWTN for comprehensive coverage. Katherine Zeltner of EWTN Pro-Life Weekly will be on the air starting at 9 a.m. Eastern. With no agreement yet on Capitol Hill, at midnight tomorrow, the U.S. government will shut down. And the president has a warning. He tweets, a government shutdown will be devastating to our military, something the Dems care very little about. U.S. officials say if a shutdown happens, active military would still report for duty. However, most of the 750,000 civilian personnel at the Department of Defense would not report to work. Pope Francis wraps up his visit to Chile today by meeting with members of the booming immigrant community. The Holy Father made a stop in the northern city of Iqueque. He celebrated mass there. His homily, he urged Chileans to be welcoming toward migrants as their ranks swell. Yesterday, Pope Francis held an emotional meeting with a group of Chile's indigenous people. And late this afternoon, the Holy Father touched down in Peru for the last stop in his two-nation tour. Juan Ignacio Brito is Dean of Communications at the University of the Andes. He's also a columnist for La Tercera, a daily newspaper in Chile. Welcome to the program, Professor. Tell us, Chile is the region's strongest and most stable economy, and that is why immigrants flock there. But many newcomers, from what I understand, from Haiti, other places are facing challenges. So how are the Chileans reacting to the Pope's call for them to be open to all immigrants? Well, you know, Chile has been a, a, an economic success story for a long while, for decades now, and it's attracting a lot of immigrants, but they do not get all what we might offer them. Uh, we, we are not treating them the way they should be treated. So the Pope has made an emphasis that we have to treat them as human beings and, and with all the dignity that we should treat everybody. So that's a, it's a message of hope for the immigrants and a call of attention for, to ourselves, to Chileans, to treat them well and receive them with, a, with an open heart. The Holy Father had an emotional meeting with Chile's Mapuche indigenous in the South yesterday. And his visit, as we've been reporting, is marked by violence. There's 11 firebombs damaging churches. Helicopters were torched. Give us a snapshot of the situation among the indigenous people. Well, you have a, this, there's a, a, a long tradition of mistreatment of, to the native peoples in Chile, you know. So the Pope has called the attention, our attention on that. And there has been some kind of violence throughout the, I would say, 10 or 15 years, for 10 or 15 years there. So 
His message was, if you want your cause to be considered just and fair, you have to abandon violence because we have had some violence, of some churches burning, some even some killings there. So the, his message was, you have a fair cause, you have a just cause, but you have to abandon violence because when violence takes over, uh, even a just cause can, can become a, a lie. That's he, what he said. He said violence begets violence. The Holy Father knows your country very well. He spent time there and was your yep. neighbor when he was Archbishop of Buenos Aires. And your countrymen know him well. How would you describe his visit overall? What media are hearing is firebombing and churches and death. But overall, how has it been received? He has been received with open arms, with, with happiness, I would say. He's, he's the leader of the Catholic Church, which is the, the majority creed of all Chileans. So, so this has been a ray of hope, I would say, with the church has undergone some problems here in Chile, especially with cases of, of child abuse, as it has happened elsewhere. But I would say that his visit was a ray of hope, of, of a ray of encouragement to Catholics, to the, to the clergymen, to, to the native peoples, to immigrants, to those who, who are in prison, who, to the young people he has, to the intellectuals. He has met with all those people and he has been constant in saying, don't give up, keep the faith, and keep going uh, as Catholics. Thank you so much, Juan Ignacio Brito, Dean of Communications at the University of the Andes. Thank you. As Mark Irons reported earlier, Vice President Mike Pence is heading to the Middle East. His trip Friday comes amid rising anti-U.S. sentiment in the region. It's stoked by President Trump's decision to recognize Jerusalem as Israel's capital. The United States is a very important country, uh, but does not have the force of international law. What is really important is what is going to be presented as a plan. There is open friction between the Trump administration and the Palestinian territories. Protesters in the West Bank have been burning posters with Vice President Pence's image. Help is on the way for the ancient Christian community working to rebuild their homes in war-torn Iraq. Officials at the federal agency that manages foreign aid say they are sending tens of millions of dollars to religious minorities that were victims of a genocide spearheaded by ISIS. Correspondent Wyatt Goolsby has the details. Good evening, Wyatt. Good evening, Lauren. The Trump administration appears to be making good on a promise it has made. USAID says up to this point, $55 million are going to help Iraq's minorities. Those are specifically focused on traditional Christian towns and villages. It's welcome news for one of the top Catholic leaders in Iraq. The Archbishop of Rabil, Bashar Warda, says U.S. engagement is vital to ensuring Christians and Yazidis are able to return and rebuild their lives in their homeland. In a recent interview with Fox News, Warda said, quote, it's important for the Americans to step in with the dollars, with the political influence, all the experience they have had over the last 100 years supporting the genocide cases, they can be of great help. The Archbishop echoed similar sentiments when we spoke with him in November while he was visiting the United Nations. It's good to remind the whole world that this is really still happening. The difficulties is still there. The challenges is huge facing this venerable communities, Christians and Yazidis and others. The Catholic leader has been vocal about the lack of assistance from the U.S. government. While at the U.N. this past fall, he helped lead a panel focused on how to improve conditions for religious minorities that together we will continue to stand with people of faith across the Middle East and that wider world. Warda and other Christian leaders were encouraged by Vice President Mike Pence's announcement in October that the U.S. would allocate foreign aid specifically to communities targeted by ISIS for genocide. Because the common bond of our humanity demands a strong response and so as a nation we pledge to support them in these trying times and every day and every day. I know the American people offer forth a chorus of prayers for these communities from our hearts to the heart of heaven. Archbishop Warda has taken in thousands of Christian families forced to flee from their towns and villages, but up until now he's seen no U.S. foreign aid. Warda and other leaders in the region say it's absolutely necessary to allocate funds for Christians specifically because their towns and villages have been neglected for so long. Lauren. Do we have a sense of how many Christians are coming back in or, or how many have, have left? 
We do have a sense of that, Lauren. USAID, which is the group that has been, or Age of the Church Anita, I should say, has been looking at the USAID numbers and millions of Christians they found have left Iraq over the past two decades since ISIS invaded Iraq in 2014. Specifically, the number of Christians now have dipped to below 250,000. So Archbishop Warda says many of those Christians, the tens of thousands who have left, probably will never return. When I was there, he was talking about uh, a lot of them who go to Australia or find family in the United States and that they don't want to go back because they don't have hope. Let's hope maybe that the U.S. Um, aid will change their Let's minds. Let's hope so. Thanks, Lord. Thank you so much, Wyatt. Correspondent Wyatt Goolsby reporting. Protesters in Poland rally against the country's pro-life laws. <laughs> chanting apologize to Polish women. The crowd also threw balloons full of red paint at the ruling conservative party headquarters. That party promotes pro-life policies. The demonstrations come after parliament voted last week against a proposal to make abortion legal for up to 12 weeks of pregnancy. And we are hearing from Callista Gingrich. This is the first time we have heard from her as U.S. Ambassador to the Holy See. She says the church's work in Africa is a model for all. The fearless leadership of the church to advance peace, justice, and prosperity in both the Democratic Republic of the Congo and South Sudan is an inspiration to the world. Ambassador Gingrich's comments came during a conference in Rome on South Sudan. Gingrich tells our Rome Bureau that the U.S. is committed to ending the violence in that nation and throughout the region. She also points out that the U.S. has given nearly $3 billion in aid to the South Sudanese people since 2013. Coming up, pro-life panel. We talk the latest good news and challenges in the battle to end abortion. And having an epiphany, the Russian and Greek Orthodox churches celebrate the baptism of Christ. The Chicago Tribune reports Mayor Rahm Emanuel accuses the city council of applying a litmus test on abortion. The tirade came after the Obama administration chief of staff won a vote yesterday to provide more than $5 million to Presence Health, a Catholic health center that doesn't perform abortions. Some city council members opposed the funding for the company's pro-life policies. Emanuel supported the subsidy, but he did point out to his own 100 percent voting record for abortion rights while he was in Congress. Pro-life activists are flocking to Washington, D.C. for tomorrow's 45th annual March for Life. This year's theme is Love Saves Lives. I am happy to welcome two of my favorite analysts, Star Parker, president of the Center for Urban Renewal and Education, and Ms. Gracie Christie with the Catholic Association, who is also a medical doctor. Welcome, ladies. Hello. Thank you. Let me start with you, Gracie. The 20-week abortion ban bill will most likely not pass Congress. Senate is trying to fast track it, but you're a doctor. Can you explain how doctors know that babies can feel pain in the womb at 20 weeks? And is this widely accepted among scientists? So scientists know, doctors know that when um, a, a baby that can't express himself because he can't cry, uh, feels pain. He has other responses that they can measure, like his cortisol levels, his heart rate, things that we can measure in other beings that feel pain, like like animals, um, without them having to express themselves. Also, uh, when babies are operated inside the womb, they are anesthetized first, because uh, the doctor doesn't want to cause the baby pain when the baby's inside. So yes, we know as doctors that babies do feel pain. Star, do you believe that there should be more support in the Senate. We just talked about this new poll that says 76 percent of Americans support some restrictions on abortion. What is it, though, that is stopping people? Well, because people are conflicted. They say that they support limitations on abortion, but then they vote for people that do not support limits on abortion. So when you look at the numbers, Democrats are overwhelmingly for abortion. And so it's very hard to get any of them to vote uh, on any type of pro-life legislation. They want death of that child 
all the way to even after it's born. Uh, so what happens, in particular, a piece of legislation, you may need 60 Senate votes. So to get those extra votes out of the Senate, remember, paying capable passed the House. It's over in the Senate, and the president says he will sign it. So the pro-death uh, operation, if you will, in industry is going to make sure that they get, keep those Democrats in line to not help with any type of passage of even something uh, like 20 weeks where we know that that child is feeling pain. There are only six other countries other than the U.S. Yeah. that don't limit abortion right. past 20 weeks. Gracie, let's move on to doctors and their response. The government now is creating an office to protect conscious rights of medical Professionals, what do you expect that the response will be in the medical community? Doctors are going to be very excited about this. I know we already are because we do feel that not only from a moral and conscience perspective, but also from the perspective of doctors that need to make the right decision for the patient regardless of big um, ideological battles that are going on in our culture. So for instance, for transgender issues, not all doctors feel that that's, those surgeries are the best thing for their patients. They don't want to be forced into doing things that they think are not medically necessary. Don't you think there'll be a backlash among medical professionals? Yes, absolutely. Well, that's one of the things that um, we're trying to control here in Washington, and people must um, admire the president for taking such an initiative in through the faith-based offices, as we saw even today, where the uh, the HHS has decided that, you know what, the religious community needs a little bit of breathing space here. So you're right, there will be a backlash, I'm sure, but now that if they're protected in law, they can have a right of conscience, in particular on these sexual matters. President Trump, most pro-life president to date, can he move in any way? pro-life legislation. Oh, it's happening already. I mean, when you start, one of the reasons that there's pressure now on the Senate to bring that vote up anyway on Friday, but hundreds of thousands will be here in Washington again, uh, marching to say it's legal, but it's not lawful in God's eyes. And we just want to remind people of the damage of Roe v. Wade on families, on babies, on, on, on our society. And with that happening, the Senate is considering bringing up ca paying capable. Whether they have the votes or not, they should do it, because you're absolutely right. President Trump, people are surprised at how proactive he is to help the church, if you will, uh, on many of these issues that concern us, including abortion. He'll be speaking in the Rose Garden Friday at noon, and he'll be addressing yeah. all of those marchers quickly yeah. before we go. I want to talk about minority communities. You're a Hispanic, you're an African American. Are they targeted? specifically when it comes to abortion. Star, I'll start with you. Overwhelmingly, and we know it. And in fact, one of my dear friends uh, has a project to try to get hearings open to see if it's even genocidal, because we know that Planned Parenthood has deliberately focused in particular communities, black and Latino communities, making sure that they do everything they can to convince these people that the children, uh, their offspring, are, are, are not welcome in this society. And so you're absolutely right. They are, uh, your community as well is being Gracie, targeted. final word for you. Yeah. And in, uh, you know, the pregnancy uh, centers, that, that take care of, of pregnant women, instead of offering them abortion, they offer them support. Mm -hmm. They cater a lot to minority women who find right. themselves materially challenged uh, during a difficult time. So yes, we have to support all the ways that minority women as well. can right. Right. Uh, bring their children into the world. They're beautiful brown and black children. Mm -hmm. But we're going to end abortion, and maybe in our lifetime now. That's what I heard from March for Life President Jeannie Mancini. She wants to not have to march in five <laughs> years, right? All right, thank you so much for joining us, Star Parker, Gracie, Christie. Thank you. Up next, it's as easy as a swipe. The Archdiocese of Paris makes a tech-savvy change to the Sunday collection plate. And in the clouds, the Pope presides in an uplifting wedding ceremony. Patriarch Kirill, the head of the Russian Orthodox Church, leads a celebration of the baptism of Christ. The faithful in Russia are preparing for a dive on their epiphany dive, yes, despite temperatures reaching 50 below. I think they're a little crazy, come on. The cold water is believed, okay, to have healing powers. Faithful from other Eastern churches are celebrating the Feast of Three Kings in the River Jordan. The site is close to where Jesus was baptized by John the Baptist, according to tradition. The Greek Orthodox Patriarch of Jerusalem led a procession to the river. The collection plate gets a technology upgrade in Paris. The archdiocese will accept payments from smart 
credit card readers, starting with Sunday's Mass. The plate has five options, from 2 to $12, and the donation will be processed in one second. The faithful can still use cash and checks. We know the church will always be happy to take the money. Finally tonight, love is in the air. Today, Pope Francis performed the first ever airborne papal wedding at 36,000 feet. Flight attendants from Chile's flagship airline Paola and Carlos were married civilly in 2010, but were unable to follow up with a church wedding because of an earthquake. So the Pope performed this ceremony aboard the papal plane on a flight from Santiago. The groom says the Pope told them he did it to motivate others to get to the sacrament of marriage. What a way to get married. How fun is that? For all of us here at EWTN News Nightly, to all of you around the world, thank you for watching. I'm Lauren Ashburn. We'll be back tomorrow with more news from a Catholic perspective. We leave you with pictures of Chile, of the Holy Father's visit. Good night and God bless you.